Hi, good evening. This is Sarah Chiu. The program is Basket Starfish, our language core. Thank you for tuning in. Um, this week, I'm going to talk about um, the sharing sound between different cultures. And um, if you have seen this program before, you will know that I am comparing all ancient languages together. I'm trying to prove that all languages are actually from one big family. That's why I use the basket starfish as the prototype. Uh, let me begin my uh, slide this week. Okay, once again, I have to show you the basket starfish. Um, this is the shape of it. So uh, basic, oops, sorry. I thought you're watching it. Yes, okay, there you go. Uh, this is the basket starfish, and uh, you will see that uh, we all share one single core, and uh, I insisted that uh, there is not separate tree families. You know, all of us coming out from one single core, and all of us are just branches, you know, so we are standing on equal ground, because only uh, when we believe in that, that uh, we'll be uh, eliminating the human hierarchy. And um, I think uh, the old mode of looking at the human languages need to be changed and um, first of all uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the different way of uh, the ancient hearing and seeing things um, of course no language is isolated because now uh, according to the uh, academic world uh, there are certain languages as uh, kind of isolated but I do not be believe in that and I think etymology is actually not linear like they uh, tell you uh, because I am looking at everything from a very uh, Asian perspective and from a female point of view so uh, all etymology is like an entangled thread and then the ancients were actually immersed in very in their early writings and they actually lived through their writing as they are not just reading it as we read word, words today okay um, this week I'm going to uh, use the swastika and this or the swirl if you like it you know to exp to tell you you know to compare different languages to let you hear the sound that's used in different languages okay uh, once again the sound that i use in chinese is cantonese a southern dialect okay and first of all uh, when you think of the swastika it has a very negative tone but when i say swirl it's as actually a neutral tone and uh, when you see this you know this is a very famous you know celtic uh, symbol Symbol. And um, and this is a very famous Phoenician symbol because by this time, you know, uh, human language had already developed. You know, they actually called it a three legged swell. That's why the Phoenicians started to actually draw legs to represent the same kind of swelling movement. So um, I will show you all different symbols used in different parts of the world and you will t uh, see all the similarity between it. Uh, now, the modern education tells us to look for differences but I uh, I do the reverse you know I want you to see the, the similar um, similarity instead of differences okay um, this is what you call the uh, Buddhist you know swastika and this is what they call the Slavic swastika and this is Hindu and this is uh, what they call the isolated language the Basque country you know in some part of Spain you know and we all have all these symbols you know uh, some drawn somewhere in uh, in the past history and then uh, in terms of writing uh, I'm showing you this you know actually you know it's actually has uh, some kind of a sound of one okay and then this is swa and also in Egyptian hieroglyph you will see that it is like something like a cross you know other than uh, looking at this kind of symbol you can understand it as a mixing of two elements okay or actually you can also look at it as something in movement as like it's swirling around and this is Chinese right here the, these two are Egyptian hieroglyph this one is Chinese and this one is also Chinese right there. It is also used, you know, to uh, indicate some kind of cyclical movement, okay? But uh, I want to show you uh, another very famous Greek uh, symbol. This right, right here, it is a snake, you know. What is written in, inside it is actually sets all is one. And this is the beginning of our religious, modern religious movement, okay? So when there are so many different cultures, 
cultures, you know, acting all together. There are people who choose to look at it in different way. And I will show you one Chinese word. This is a Chinese word one. This is uh, actually um, the word that we use to describe the ancient world before anything. One actually means the mixing together. So it's a confusing stage, you know, but then in a way, it actually means one. When it's all mixed, it's actually one. So it depends on where you stand, whether you prefer a society with all cultures mixing together as one or you would uh, ex um, interpret it in another way. Look at this word. It is also used this X. You know, this is a Greek word chaos. This is how you get the word chaos, you know, because from the Greek world you get the meaning of chaos. So somehow this X begin to have a very negative tone. So when the Chinese is, uh, brings in a neutral uh, tone, of being one when things together as one and then the other mixed together is like a chaos so you will see that this is actually a very uh, interesting starting point from the difference of uh, view from the east and from the west okay and then after you looking at this sound one right there when things are mixed together I will ask you one very simple question why does the most simple English word one defile the rule of English writing because you look at English as a very very um meticulously uh, scientific writing, right? But why is that the one spell like this? If you follow the rule, it should be uh, pronounced as one or une, something like uh, you are speaking uh, Latin, right? Une or uno in, in Spanish, just one, right? But why do you say one right there? So I tell you that because it is an oral tradition. It is the memory of an, a very ancient sound. So they use the one exactly like the Chinese when we say one okay so it is meaning that things are mixed together as one entity okay so now I want to uh, use also another Chinese symbol to show you the English uh, uh, mutation between the W and the R sound. A world is also something wrong, right? So um, I will show you uh, this uh, ancient Chinese ring. This is a very uh, ancient symbol of the female. And uh, as you, if you look at it carefully, you will see something very interesting. Inside this big ring itself, there is a Tons of tiny little swell like this and uh, it is technically very very difficult to make this one definitely is a true ancient one because later on this technique has lost can you see that the plain surface actually has this little hill coming up you know like a little knob and these uh, carved things are actually done on top of this uh, little hill top like that so uh, technically it is very difficult to achieve you know especially in the ancient time when you don't when we don't know that they have machinery so we still do not understand how they can make it like that sometime around 2000 years ago this technique had already gone you know so whenever we see you know uh, techniques like this we know that it's at least 3000 years old okay so uh, how about you know how come this thing is like this but I will show you one very interesting thing if you are speak English you look at this thing you will un you will say it is a whole right but I tell you something very interesting in Chinese it actually uh, out of the blue in very ancient time that we use a word uh, pronounced as whole we say this is a whole of that ring right there and the whole itself you know actually carries a very fertility note that means the whole that you know the uh, through which the female conceived the baby so this whole is actually means a cavity itself but um, no longer do we use use it in daily life you know it is still used in very very ancient term but if I bring you to the uh, modern English word hold they sound exactly the same and mean exactly the same thing and then if I point it to you and German word 
Hülle, you will also understand it as a cavity. So you will see that uh, this ancient Chinese more than 3,000 years old sound hole and the modern English hole and the German hole all means exactly the same thing. And this ring actually uh, we know that in ancient time was a ritual um, object that we used to worship the sky which somehow carried the tone of a female. And this is actually, you know, the, the hole, the cavity cavity of a female so you can understand it you know as the worm itself so the ancient actually look at the world and understand the world in a very different way from us okay so uh, having given having given you this you know uh, little example of how we share sound in ancient time I want to go back to show you you know the the mutation of sound in a very um, interesting way from an ancient point of view okay um, the uh, linguist always Always tell you that a uh, certain sound mutate to another sound and mutate to another sound in a linear way but in this uh, slide I will show you you know I don't call it mutation I just say it, that the sound is shifting from one sound to the other but I will also show you that they always move in reciprocal cycles and direction so it really depends on where you stand in the history of time um, I will give you this as example okay the W sound and when it goes one direction, you can actually look at it, the O and O, uh, you can understand it as the vowel uh, shifting, okay? So uh, from O, you can also uh, go onward to the A and E, you know, but uh, in this slide, I won't go that direction, but I will concentrate uh, from this W right there. So if you look at it as a uh, vowel direction, it will go this way. But if you look at it as, as a consonant, it will come like this, okay? the wa and the ra and then the la the ra and the la and and you will see that you know it in a way you don't think it's think it's possible but because I travel around you know for more than 20 years in very remote places I always you know get myself confused when I try to write down the sound that I heard, I realized very easily that these sounds actually mutate between person to person. You know, it is very interesting. From R to L, from Ra to La to Na, and it is a very easy uh, mutation. And then when the Na sound becomes a nasal, it also mutates easily to become an M. Okay, so this is a line on its own. So if you look, go back to this direction, you if you look at the W as a semi-vowel as the linguist said they can also go this direction the V is also the, the semi-vowel okay because the V sometimes can be used as the U and W also used as the U okay but if you go to the consonant side of course the V will be easily shifting to the F sound okay V and V okay and then the V can also shift to the B sound and then the B sound can easily also shift back to the F sound but uh, I want you to understand between the B, this and the M, uh, believe it or not, in real life, they actually mutate between these two very easily. Once again, because I try to write down the sounds that I hear in real life, but, uh, uh, but I can never catch them because one person will be using the B sound very strongly. Another person saying the same word will be using the M sound strongly. So this two sound actually has a very close relationship in real life. So when I go back to the consonant, you will see the V also easily mutated to the P, P V and P, and then the P and the F, of course, P and V also. So in this um, in this internal changes, you will see this is a quadrilateral relationship between these four sounds. And then between this sound, this is also the, uh, uh, another little cycle within this sound. Okay, so it is all entangled, so it's never as linear as the uh, linguist taught you, okay? So, but today I'm going to uh, concentrate in two and very interesting sound. If in English you look at these two sound, you will say, tell me that there is no relationship at all. But if you really believe so, I will prove to you uh, in the next slide, okay? But uh, today I'm going to talk to you about this sound, this sound, and also this sound. Uh, th between these two sound is very easy. But between these two sound, I will give you one very simple example, like the Spanish word one, okay? Okay? Juan. If you speak it like a Spanish, it will be Juan, okay? Like with an H, right? But 
in reality, when I hear it, people in, he speak here in America, sometimes Juan will be spoken as Juan, okay? So you will see that it's very interesting that H and W can be more close in real life than you expect them to be. So in the light, next slide, you will see um, how about, uh, about writing. First of all, I want to divert you a little bit to the other side. Uh, many weeks ago, I already told you how I realized, you know, the importance importance in using your fingers to write and uh, because in ancient Chinese history it is actually written down the earliest writing came from uh, all the tracks in the sand so I spent many hours standing in the Sahara Desert you know watching how you know marks were being made on the sand so I actually begin to realize that many many interesting things you can realize on the sand if you draw on the sand you can actually get a very interesting concept which will you never get with writing with a pen. Very simple. Look at this one right here. Two insects crossing its path but at a different time. You will know that one small insect you know actually cross this way and another bigger insect actually cross the other way. So by looking at the sand you actually understand a lot more than by writing itself. So that's writing really is just simply writing as we understand it in the modern sense i don't think so so let me take you to some ancient writing you will understand what i'm trying to say okay so um again i'll use the swell as the subtle concept in writing you can only understand this if you use your hand you can never understand it if you get used to typing things in a computer because you just uh, punch things in you do not use your hands to connect to your brain so I will use this um, in this box you will see ancient Egyptian hieroglyph this is ancient Egyptian hieroglyph W you will see the swirling form you need to use your finger okay and then this is an H again you will see the swirling form okay and the other box I'll show you ancient Chinese okay we have exactly the same form but if I uh, pronounce it in Cantonese it will be Woi or Wan if I pronounce it in uh, Mandarin it will be Hui or Huen so you will see that even within our own language in Chinese it is um, I mean fluctuating between the W and the H sound so isn't it interesting so you will see that the ancient is like this so um, nobody really knows whether the ancient Egyptian also treats it exactly the same way okay so <clears throat> I will show you after I show you those sound mutation I will also show you the F sound the P or the fur, okay? So you will see that it's also a turning thing. And I go back to the Chinese side, there is a word we say far. Far is actually, you can see that like two person turning upside down like that way. And as time went by, it becomes simplified like this. And you can actually understand it as the mod, uh, we use it exactly as the Greek will say metamorphosis, okay? And that's why the metamorphosis, the fur is actually like this. You have to use your finger to understand that swirling movement that uh, represent a change a turn you know and also you know uh, 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 some airy swirl that happens in your brain okay so you really need to use your finger to understand this subtle meaning okay so uh, now what you're looking at is actually Hebrew again this is actually a per or fur sound you can compare it to ancient Egyptian hieroglyph you can compare it to ancient Greek they all represent you know the the, the turning movement okay so this is the cursive form Hebrew in uh, the P or the F and this is the ending form of the P and F. You can see that already somehow it is uh, begin to have the F form you know in English now okay. So uh, nothing is only uh, limited to uh, its itself. I mean all culture has to communicate with each other so we can churn out more and more interesting culture. So nobody can separate and isolate themselves and create new things. And, and look at this. This is uh, ancient, uh, I mean no, this is uh, Arabic. This is the F sound. Again, if you write it, it is also, you know, a turn in your own hand that communicate with the brain also. Okay. So um, again, I, I back to the Chinese side you will see this sign right here okay the far okay and you will see that this is actually the ancient Greek form of 
foul. This actually uh, became um, not used and then it disappeared from, from the Greek uh, writing. But you will see that exactly the same form is right there. And this is the vowel sound. The vowel actually um, is uh, carry on in, in the uh, semantic world. But before I go on that, I bring you back to the Chinese writing right there. The Chinese writing has something like this. For us, it is like uh, a voice, like the wind, anything coming from heaven. Okay. Of course, in the same time, at the same time, the other part of the world, the Bible keeps saying that you know whenever. God appears, you know, it will be always his voice coming out or it will always be a wind that blowing off. So you will see exactly the same thing that's happening in the other side of the world, in the east, you know. We use it to mean a fl the flow of air or the water, okay. When it flows of air, it is actually the wind. Uh, pay attention, this is actually uh, the W here right now, okay. The swirl uh, that actually represents the wind or the water, okay. And then in, in Chinese, we use it as the word. Of course, the word, you know, in English, it will also, you know, mutate and shift it into the V and become also the verb, become an action. Because all creation started, you know, from this air blowing out on top of the earth. And it is from God's word that every, every changes and every creation happen. So you will see that we actually have something parallel in the East and the West. And then um, in the, I'll take you to the spiritual world of the Tibetan. The Tibetan used this symbol to uh to signify the beginning of any writing. So for them, this is, you know, any words, you know, from heaven or from some authoritative or, or respectable source. You will see that the, it was used in, in the same way. So when they try to quote something, when they write something out, this is the kind of quotation they use. So the word is always the wind, the air, okay? So they use it in a very, very naive, ancient sense, okay? So, um, in the Chinese writing, we also have something like this. We still have the, the meaning of a cloud or the air, okay? And then when it gets more complicated, it becomes the soul. But the reading itself is either one in Cantonese or huan in, in Mandarin. So you will see this sound is always lingering around. And then if I try to read this word, you know, because I lived in the uh, Semitic world for a long time, the ruh or rich always represent the wind or the soul it's also always use uh, the mutation of w which is the r okay the ruh okay so it is the soul so when i come to this side of the the world you know this is the r so if you write it you will see the curve right there the r and then this is also the u the semi vowel you know the ruh is actually used to write like this and if you write in that this is Hebrew okay and if you write in Arabic it is exactly the same thing you you draw this curve with your hand and another curve with your hand this is also representation the ruh of the soul okay so or the wind and then um, you go back to the ancient um, Greek world this is the R so if you write the R it should be this way in another curve like this, this is the way you should write the R in ancient Greek, in Greek, okay? So this is the R word. You will see that this W, R, or U, they are all curving in uh, concepts in your brain. They all represent those swirl. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the linguist will tell you that it represents the ras, the head. Of course, it's true that the owl it, itself is somehow there was a time that it represented the head. But sometimes, you know, things never get lost. The ras actually in Phoenician actually adopted by the, by the Hebrew. And this is the Aramic writing of the cuff. The cuff actually means the head again. Uh, the head, head or also it means the cycle, the circle or something curving so you will see that you know a lot of the meaning actually is still you know involved you know in all this writing so I will take you back to the Eastern world you will see a uh, uh, writing like this this is called uh, homot you know in Thai in the Thai language whenever they finish writing something marking the end they will write this very interesting infinity sign. If you look at this F sign, if you look at this, you will see it is actually the infinity sign. Okay, so at to mark the end, you know, they actually means to finish. They actually don't want it to finish. So they actually 
put in something that means infinity because for the ancient always they want cycles to go on and on they want nothing to stop so this is all uh, coincide with the ancient belief that goes back to this ancient expression of the rain and the little swell that uh, that existed inside this big rain itself. So again, in, in Cantonese, it will be Huan. In, in Mandarin, it will be Huan. So you will see the reading, the writing, the concept, they are all coincide with each other. So without uh, combining all the language together, we will never able to get to the bottom of the reality. So uh, the modern language separate. I think by separating, we are further and further from the ancient truth. Okay, so I will go on. And this is the uh, one of the very easy thing that I want to show you the uh, the very easy uh, sharing of wood. This is the natural fence that you will see uh, because uh, many years ago I was sent to Honduras. You know, in the eighties, I was sent to represent Hong Kong in an international youth program. And whenever I see this kind of uh, natural uh, setting, I will know that there is a no man's land. It's always between settlement. You will find this kind of uh, natural uh, surrounding because it is a natural fence that no one really want to walk through okay so I would let and, and of course in reality you pop on trees you know it will become a fence to block the other people and later on I was very interested to find out you know in English this kind of landscape is actually called fence and of course you know this kind of mock uh, boggy places and also swampy places no one wanted to walk through so um, this is fence of course in Boston you will see this is Fenway when I first came but until I finally walk around I finally realized this is a real fence and then I will show you this is a real ancient Chinese writing more than 3,000 years ago. This is fun. Exactly means fans. So you will see how easily we share all this writing together. And I don't think I have the time to show you all the words that we're sharing. And um, because uh, the slide of what, what I would like to show you is that, you know, the fans or fans word we actually share between tons of different language family as they as the link. Show, but.